Sengoku. You and the world government are afraid of the great battle that will engulf the entire world one day. Just as there are those that inherited Roger's will, there will be those that inherited Ace's. And you may kill their bloodline, but their will will never die. It has been passed down for generations, unbroken through the ages. And someday, someone will show up, carrying hundreds of years of history on their shoulders and will challenge this entire world to a fight. I have no interest in it myself, but when someone finds the treasure, and they will, this entire world will be turned upside down. The One Piece! I'm pretty sure you guys know the rest of that. And the reason for why I decided to include Whitebeard's speech here in the first place is to compare and connect his words with Odin's words in this chapter, sort of see how like they echo each other and how they kind of follow the same theme. Okay, so judging by the cover spread and the cover of Shonen Jump, this chapter was sponsored by Cup of Noodle Soup. Marketing for the product actually spawned several commercials featuring the Shaw Hats redesigned to fit like a slice of life anime. They're all pretty short and the animation looks really cool. Uh, I think for me personally, the Marine Ford one is the best one. And the thing about these commercials though is that they're so oversaturated with Easter eggs and cameos that you have to pause every half a second to catch them all. Uh, but regardless, it's a new visual take on the world of One Piece, and I feel like it also serves as good mental prep for the live action. We start off the chapter with Shinobu being threatened by the Oniwabanchu, or primarily the leader, Fukuru Kuju, and I think that that scene could possibly be setting up a fight between the two of them in the present. We see some citizens of Wano requesting Orochi to stop the execution, but unfortunately they get shot with arrows and so they are silenced. But I think this is important because it shows that thanks to what Shinobu did in the previous chapter, which was reveal the truth, there are people in Wano that know that Odin wasn't this foolish, crazy lord that was dancing in the street naked just because. And so that mentality or that message, the truth about, about Odin, has reached some people and will fuel the, the rebellion and the insurrection. I remember back when we were first introduced to Otama, Otama was saying, uh, when the Kazuki clan returns, you'll be sorry for doing this. So that kind of shows that despite the children of Wano, some of the children being indoctrinated against Odin, because if you remember that scene in the school where the teacher was teaching them about uh, how Odin was this evil guy and he had nine evil scabbards and that Lord Orochi was the hero of the story and that he defeated Odin. Uh, despite that, there are still people that heard the truth from Shinobu that day and that passed it on to their kids or to, to people that they know. And so that, that truth will be very, very helpful for Luffy in the present time. Not only that, but you see the people actually running to send messages via arrows to the rest of the daimyo of Wano. You see Yasui reading that message. I'm pretty sure that Shimotsuki Ushimaru, uh, the character that people theorize is Zoro's father, also got the message via an arrow because he was daimyo of Ringo. And so we know that eventually he dies after Odin dies because he refuses to uh, bow down to Orochi or to, I guess, bend the knee. But in that panel where you see Yasui reading the message, you see a character that is wearing the same kind of emblem, the two-sworded crest on, on his shirt, on his clothing, as Koshido does. Apparently the boiling oil in the pot surpassed 700 degrees, which just to give you an idea, that's like the low end of the temperature of lava coming out of a volcano. I know this probably must have sucked for Odin, but I really liked the banter of the scabbards when they're on top of the plank. Like there's this part where a citizen says like, thank you for protecting us, Lord Odin. And then the scabbards are like, oh, now they care. Wow. So Odin starts talking about preparing Wano for the coming of Joy Boy. And if you notice, Orochi, like he hears this, but he doesn't understand what Odin is talking about. There's a little panel with, with Orochi and Kaido and Orochi's like, what is he on about? What's he talking about? But Kaido stays silent. We just see him like looking at it like, huh? And he has a question mark. So I think this is the reason, this is how Kaido finds out about Odin knowing about Laugh Tale. And I think this is why he eventually ends up uh, persecuting and chasing after the scabbards. Odin says this, he says, long, long ago, the ones responsible for closing this nation to the rest of the world were the Kazuki clan. And it was to protect Wano from a great external power. I already talked about what I think happened and 
what I think Odin is referring to, but just in case, I'll just give you a brief rundown. So after the Void Century, the people that uh, belonged to Joy Boy's kingdom, right, or, or the people of the, of the D clan, if you will, they left behind a message or, you know, messages with the truth about what happened during the Void Century. And th th this record or these, these messages are known as the Poneglyphs, right? And the Poneglyphs were uh, written by the Kazuki clan. They were the ones who were able to inscribe the messages in, in those uh, blocks of, of whatever material they're made of. But the point here is that the world government, after the Void Century, they found out about the existence of the Poneglyphs. And since you can't really destroy the Poneglyphs, what you can do is try to destroy the people that can read them, right? Which is why Robin's O'Hara, like, you know, the entire island was blown to bits. But the Kazuki clan was the one who invented, you know, that language and inscribed those Poneglyphs. So what the world government did, I think, was that they went to the Kazuki clan and they said, you have two options. Either you isolate yourself from the rest of the world so that nobody ever finds out what these things say, right? Or we destroy you. So Imu or the Gorosei probably paid a visit to the leader of the Kazuki clan and said something like, threatened the leader of the Kazuki clan by saying, if you like living in this happy land of Wano, then you better cut yourself off from the rest of the world. Because if people learn the secrets of the Kazuki clan, of your clan, and they learn how to read the Poneglyphs, then they're gonna get to laugh tale. And if they find the truth, they're gonna want to overthrow us and that's gonna cause a war. Just like Whitebeard said, right? And in fact, this chapter kind of confirms a feeling or an assumption that I've had for a very long time, which is that the world government has an ace up its sleeve. It has to have some kind of force, whether it be a weapon or uh, a character that is so powerful, that is so broken and OP, that it can compete with the Yonko and with the ancient weapons. And here's why. If you remember, when Roger was on his way to Laugh Tale, he asked um, Madame Shirley, when is, when is the princess, the, the mermaid princess, going to be born? When is Poseidon going to be born? And she's like, you're, you're going to have to wait, right? Poseidon is an ancient weapon. Uh, we know that uh, the blueprints for Pluton, Frankie burned them in Aeneas Lobby. So, so it's not like the government has access to the mermaid princess or Pluton. And if they don't have access to those two, I don't see how they would have access to Uranus. And so with that in mind, remember that Roger told Rayleigh after they went to Laugh Tale, I guess we were too early, right? Because they were waiting for the awakening of these ancient weapons. And it, it, it almost sounds like in order to challenge the world government, you need to have all three ancient weapons on your side, which is crazy. It's like, will you need all three to be able to challenge, not just, not even win against the world government, but to compete with the world government. Otherwise, why would you be waiting for the, for the ancient weapons to, to rise up, right? So it's, it's very, 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 very scary how much power the world government has that it hasn't shown yet. And then when it comes to the Yonko, I've already stated that the world government is using those four main players as a buffer or as, as obstacles for other pirates so that other pirates or newcomers never find the One Piece because they're so powerful that they can just stop stop new pirates from you know going on their way and then getting to Laugh Tale. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it's all in the world government's favor. And then when the Yonko misbehave themselves or try to form alliances, that's where the government calls in the Marines to stop them. As we saw, like when, when Kaido and Big Mom uh, were, were talking about making the alliance, the Marines were like, whoa, we, we got to send people to Wano, right? Uh, and they're not going there anymore, according to Kobe, because an, another issue popped up. But normally, like they would have sent Marines to stop that alliance or like see like what's going on here, because that is not in the government's favor. And then when a Yonko misbehaves, that's when the Marines and the world government play an active role in trying to destroy and take down that Yonko, as we saw with Whitebeard in Marineford. Odin says that the entire world is awaiting a figure, and when that figure appears after an 800 year span, which by the way, since it's heavily implied that Joy Boy died during the Void Century, and the Void Century happened uh, about 800 years ago, it's looking more and more likely that Luffy will turn out to be the reincarnation of Joy Boy. I'm not really sure how I feel about that possibility just yet because whenever I read something that alludes to it, I get flashbacks to Naruto and uh, how him and Sasuke 
and Madara and Hashirama were also reincarnations. And so it's kind of like, uh, I hope Oda like does that or takes that concept and does something different with it. So right now I'm very cautious about like this being the case, but let me know how do you feel about that? I really like the incorporation of the panel where Odin pretty much knows that he's gonna die that day. Like he says, like even before the time runs out, he says, I'm gonna be very clear with you. They're gonna kill me today. And I like that because it got me to think about Luffy and his fight versus Katakuri. Remember how like Rayleigh said, like Luffy, you can kind of sense people's intentions. So it's kind of like, I feel like that's what's going on here where it's like, nope, th these guys, they're gonna change something. I'm gonna die. Like, I'm not. I'm not getting out alive from this. And I also made the connection last week in the previous chapter of like why Momonosuke was crying. Uh, and so I think maybe there's something about that that they can sense. And because Roger, Odin, Luffy, and Momonosuke are the only known characters to understand Sunisha, I think that that is connected to the voice of all things. I also think it's super interesting how Denjiro was about to say something, but then Raizo cuts him off. Then we should join Lord Orden and the official translation makes it seem as if he wanted to also die alongside Odin, but I think there has to be more to it than that because Denjiro is the only scabbard that we literally know nothing about in the present. So I hope that that line that was cut off pays off. We also find out what Ino Arashi and Nekomamushi's argument and fight was about, because remember, they stay behind fighting. And so in this chapter, it's it's very clear that what happened was that Nekomamushi was kind of taunting Kaido. He was like, nah, nah, yeah, you know, Odin survived the hour, and now he has this country on his side, so you better watch out, Kaido. And then Inorashi was telling him, yo, you calm down, like, keep your mouth shut. You know, this guy, you don't want to taunt this guy because that can cause more trouble. And then Nekomamushi's is like, but why? Like, he won fair and square. So Inuarashi was just trying to be cautious and <laughs> Nekomamushi just wanted to run his mouth. So that's the argument. And I, I can pretty much see each other kind of blaming each other for Odin's death. Inuarashi probably told Nekomamushi something like, stupid cat, if you had just kept your mouth shut, none of this would have happened. And then the cow's like, no, shut up, you stupid dog. Odin survived the hour. Kaido and Orochi are garbage. I hate you. And I think Odin telling Kaido to become stronger can serve two practical purposes. One of them is like an end game, like a like an end game plot point, future of the story kind of thing where maybe Odin, since he's gone to Laughdale and he knows what the One Piece is and how once the One Piece gets found, that's going to cause a war against the world government. Maybe he's telling Kaido to get stronger so that he and some of the other Yonko can go up against Emu or, you know, be able to challenge at least, try and make a dent on the forces of the world government. Maybe Odin knows that the world government has like some some hidden weapon that is just even more powerful than the Yonko. And maybe that's why he's telling Kaido, Kaido, you gotta, you gotta boost up, my man. Which is crazy to think that the world government would have something that strong. But anyway, he could also technically be asking Kaido to get stronger as a way of training Luffy. Maybe he wants Kaido to get stronger so that when the new Joy Boy arrives, Kaido can kind of serve to train the new Joy Boy and, you know, make Luffy a lot stronger. Because I always go back to that scene in Enya's Lobby where Luffy is kind of thanking his opponents. He says, I'm, I'm really glad that I got to meet people like you, that I got to run into people like you, strong people like you. Even Aokiji, I'm glad I met him because it's, it's because of you guys that I've been able to get stronger. So it's this thing about like, you know, if my opponent is strong, I, I, I have to, consequently, I have to get a lot stronger myself. I need to be prepared for the future and I'm, I'm glad that this happened, even if I struggle a lot. And even sometimes when I take L's, it's a good thing because I grow from that, I get stronger. And I also think it's very, very important that Odin only makes that comment to Kaido after Kaido reveals that he's killed the old hag. Again, it just reveals more of Kaido's characters. Like, that was not a fair fight. I, you know, don't worry. There were consequences because of that. So I, I kill, I killed the old hag. And we knew that the old hag was going to die anyway because Bong Clay has her devil fruit. But I really wish that we could have seen Kaido actually kill the old hag. I think that would have been like a great, great panel. Because in that chapter, 970, after the old hag tricks Odin by transforming into Momonosuke, and after Kaido hits Odin, Kaido looks pissed. I mean, 
seething. He reminded me of like Katakuri and how Katakuri was so angry at Flampe for shooting those darts. I knew Kaido had a code. I'm glad to see that the code that he has now kind of goes way back. It's not just something that he picked up recently. Now here's the thing, and this is why the quality of the translation is important. Because in the official translation, Kaido never says, I killed the old hag. He says, I had her killed, which means that somebody else did the killing. Here's the thing, I like the idea of Kaido saying, I was the one who killed the old hag better, but at the end of the day, it's not about what I like, it's about what is the most accurate translation. So which is it? Also, according to the official translation, instead of Odin kind of encouraging Kaido to get stronger, Odin says something like, you know, build up your strength while you still can. Almost like saying, you know, you won't last very long. So, you know, have fun while you can. So those are two very different interpretations, two very different meanings. And it's very frustrating to me because what happens is that you end up with uh, people that take one over the other and they run with that. And so what you have is that when it comes to discussion and theories and speculation, you have uh, fans talking and supporting their arguments with things that are in the text, according to them, that the characters never said in the first place. Long story short, I really miss Jaimini's and Manga Stream because even though they weren't perfect, I think that they were the perfect blend, uh, the, the perfect midpoint between the, the, the translations that we're getting now. They would get the editor notes, and then whenever there was a mistake, they would clarify and correct them later on. Now, the way that Oda drew Odin getting shot, I think, is a visual reference to other moments where characters have died by being shot as well in, in other flashbacks. He did the same thing with uh, Belmir, and he did the same thing with Professor Clover in uh, Ohara, in Aeneas Lobby. What's interesting here, though, is that the way that Kaido rationalizes shooting Odin is that he's being merciful. He, he, Kaido tells Odin, either way, your body is already dead. So it's kind of like, your body is useless at this point. And he says, I'll do you a kindness and put you out of your misery. It makes it seem as if Kaido is killing Odin out of a sense of compassion. And then Kaido also says, they will speak of you for years to come, saying that you died a spectacular death. It almost sounds like Kaido is jealous, right? Because remember, like one of the things that Kaido wants to do is die. And then Odin does that kabuki pose. And he says that I will be a story to accompany your drinks with. And I'm like, is that the root of Kaido's drinking? Is that where Kaido's alcoholism stems from? From Odin saying like, yes, be jealous of me. Now become an alcoholic. So the news of Odin's death reaches Toki and there's a moment where she starts reading a letter that was left by Odin. And Odin says that if he fails to defeat Kaido, there will be no others or there will be no one who will be able to take him down for a long time. Which is very interesting because Whitebeard is still around, right? Does that mean that Kaido was stronger than Whitebeard even back then? And then Odin also wrote that there will likely be a war terrible enough to split the seas. And so the splitting of the seas, I mean, that that's what happens when two Yonko clash, right? We get a flashback panel of Odin handing his swords, his two swords to Toki so that she can pass them down. And I'm pretty sure we missed a speech bubble, the bit of dialogue from Odin where he's whispering to Toki, I want you to start a rumor. I want you to tell people that I only used Enma to cut Kaido, not Ame no Habakiri, just Enma. Do that for me. Enma has always been my favorite. Also, I could technically use these two swords to cut my way out of this prison, but I really want to die. This flashback has been going on for way too long, Toki. You know it's true. Then of course we know that the time jump happens and 20 years into the future and then Toki decides to stay behind and she makes the prophecy which aligns perfectly with Odin's wish, right? Or with, with Odin's statements throughout this chapter. And so the prophecy of Toki goes like this. She says, Like the moon, you are ignorant of the dawn. If there is one ardent wish that must be fulfilled, it will be when nine shadows are cast, woven together throughout twenty years of moonlit nights. Only then shall you understand that the night is darkest right before the dawn, and the dawn is coming. Okay, I have to admit, I, I took that last bit from The Dark Knight. But it's still a good quote, and I think it adds more power to the whole thing. I'm not really one to get emotional about stuff or to be, like, super reactionary 
uh, and just, you know, have a very quick emotional response to things, uh, which is why I don't, I don't do live reactions. You know, there are some exceptions to, to moments where I have reacted emotionally uh, and I tell you, like, this is what's going on. And some moments that come to mind are like, well, the first one I think is the Obito reveal. That's the big one. Um, and then like, but from One Piece, it's like uh, Sabo coming back, um, Usopp getting hockey, uh, Luffy getting one-shotted, I, you know, th that kind of stuff. Oh, and then like Luffy going gear fourth, that, I thought those moments, that, that triggered an emotional reaction. But for the most part, I, I'm pretty uh, contained uh, because I think that helps my analytical skills, right? So I usually have the logical part of my brain overpowering and superseding the emotional part. And I didn't think that I would get emotional while reading this chapter because theoretically we already know what's going to happen, right? We, we know that Odin dies. We know that that's how this flashback should end. So I wasn't expecting it to get me. Um, and, and what's interesting is that it wasn't even Odin's death that got me because Odin lived a remarkable, a remarkable life. And the way he, he died was just so like, he, he fulfilled his purpose and he died with a smile on his face, connection to the people of the D-Clan, the will of D, all that stuff. Um, so, so there was a sense of fulfillment in, in his death. And he owns it. He takes the moment of his death and makes a kind of a joke or a pun out of it. That pun is yet another example of me liking the unofficial translation as opposed to the official, because in the official, Odin says like, I am Odin and I was born. And then the, the citizens complete the sentence saying, to boil, you know, I was born to boil. But in the other translation I read, Odin says, I am Odin and the more Odin is boiled. And then the citizens complete saying, the better it is. But the thing that did it for me was the panels with the scabbards running away, like just breaking down, running away and you get this trip down memory lane of how Odin essentially took them under his wing and made better men out of all of them. And the one that got me the most was the one with Neko, Inu, and Kawamatsu because they were, they were being discriminated against and Odin stepped in. Odin was the one who fought for them and who tried to educate people to not discriminate, to not hate others because they're different. And you can see it in their face as they're running away. Like they know that's gone. You know, that that rare thing is gone. I always, I always pity the living whenever there's a, a passing because the living, they're the ones that have to grieve, right? Uh, they're the ones that are not at peace. Um, but anyway, I also want to say that if the traitor, the traitor better, better not be a scabbard after this. If the traitor happens to be a scabbard, I will hate them more than I hate Orochi. One of the things I've noticed, one of the patterns that I've identified in people that go on to become legends, whether it be in real life or in One Piece, characters like Roger or Luffy or Whitebeard or Dr. Hiroluk is that they don't fear death. It reminds me of that quote from Joker in The Dark Knight where he says, that in their final moments, people show you who they really are. So it's very fitting for Odin to go out this way. And there's a couple of panels there where both Odin and Toki kind of echo Roger's words of, I'm not gonna die. What we do in life echoes in eternity. That's a quote from Gladiator. I'm full of quotes this morning. <laughs> uh, by the way, shout out to Toki for keeping it together, man. That is that is real strength, I mean, especially with the kids around. I mean, that what a woman. Overall, I thought the chapter was great. Let me know your thoughts about it. It's a very heavy chapter. Again, because like the scabbards, like just how broken they are while they're running away. They're leaving their master behind. You know, the, the person responsible for making them better people died in this chapter and he died with a smile. But the fight's not over. The fight continues 20 years into the future. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you then. Take care. Bye.